Well, I think it very much reflects the June meeting of the Governing Council. And uh, in a speech format today, the President was able maybe to elaborate on the message which was maybe conveyed in a more uh, concise, uh, abstract format in, in our monetary policy statement. And uh, essentially, I think the message uh, from today's speech, which is the message, I think, of collectively of the Governing Council, is we do have a central scenario. Our baseline scenario is inflation being high, coming back down at, at to 3.5 more or less next year, and then uh, more close to the target in 24. But we, we have to recognize in a world of uncertainty that we, we will have to be agile, that if some of the clear risk factors do materialize, or if those risk factors go up, uh, we, we will have to uh, uh, be more uh, decisive uh, and to move rates more quickly. But let me again emphasize, that is just uh, one scenario. Under our baseline, uh, we've explained that we intend to raise rates by 25 in, in July, and we intend to raise again in September, where the scale of that increase will be data dependent. And then we said, after that, uh, we expect a gradual but sustained further set of increases. So I think it's, it's you know, uh, fairly clear that we have a baseline, but with the uncertainty, uh, we have to manage the two risks. On the one side, there could be forces that keep inflation higher than expected for longer. On the other side, we do have the risk of a slowdown in the economy, which would uh, reduce inflationary pressure. So uh, it's very much uh, having a clear vision for the next couple of meetings, having an orientation to move away from the very low rates we've had for quite a few years, uh, but also fully respecting the importance of being data dependent mm. and uh, to retain the optionality to respond to what we see uh, in the coming months. The market is more or less pricing in some 150 to 200 basis points by March 2023. So is the market correct in that anticipation? Well, I think, the, again, with that market uh, pricing, it's a reflection of, if you like, their expectation of where the policy rate is going, plus, of course, uh, the risk premium. And in today's world, uh, the market also uh, is, is going to price the risk um, of the uncertainty that we face. So I don't really want to uh, particularly comment on, on whether that's the, the, uh, a very good forecast of where rates will go. And in the end, uh, for us, going back, uh, we've been clear about the there will be two hikes in, in July and in September. We've been clear that we expect a gradual but sustained series of hikes after that. But essentially, for us, uh, we, we need to be data dependent. Mm. And where we end up in the coming months will be driven by the, how strong will be the inflation momentum versus how severe will be any slowdown risk coming, come from, coming from recessionary forces. Ah, oh, that's from here. OK. Will we? From where? Is it interfering they turn, with? They turned it off, right? No. Sorry. I'm not sure we wait. <laughs> this is uh, bizarre. <laughs> that could be an interesting world if we had background music for interviews. <laughs> I first thought that's it was the a very docile ringtone of <laughs> some nice. mobile phone. Uh, is it a problem for the audio? Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's a bit like, I mean, you probably don't know Lorio. It's a German comedian. Um, like from many years ago, he, it, it was like, he always did this real life exaggeration. Oh, yeah. And it's super funny. <laughs> But you don't speak German, right? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a shame. I think it's only available in German. At least it fits my humor. OK, fine. Um, <clears throat> Christine Lagarde was also saying that there's a risk of inflation um, or a start of a self-fulfilling spiral. So what has to happen that you would say, OK, wait a moment, inflation is having some self-reinforcement mechanism? So I think it's, it's, it's uh, really boils down to um, 
really two forces. So we, we know uh, one uh, issue is going to be the evolution of inflation expectations. So whether that's in the market, whether it's, it's among expert forecasters or other measures coming from households and firms. Because clearly um, there's a very different uh, dynamic uh, that would take hold if on top of the inflation we've seen already, which has been a surprise, uh, the world has been taken by surprise by having inflation in the last 12 months around 8%. If, uh, in addition to absorbing and adjusting to this currently high inflation rate, uh, if decisions were based on a belief that uh, this would persist into the future, that inflation would remain well above 2% indefinitely, um, and so for us and for all central banks, monitoring expectations will be very important. I think the other big uh, metric to look at will be uh, wage settlements. So the way uh, you can get that spiral is high prices now uh, give rise to high wage settlements, which in turn give, give rise to a further uh, wave of price increases. So, so far, I mean, we, we've been clear we're closely monitoring uh, wage settlements. We do think they're going to be higher than normal. Uh, there is a catch-up effect uh, that with the 8% inflation rate we're seeing right now. Uh, over time, we do expect uh, nominal wages to have to increase more than normal. Uh, but it's a very diff big difference between a catch-up um, dynamic, which is in our forecast, versus a more unstable situation where uh, wage settlements not only reflect that catch-up, but it, it reflects a belief that inflation uh, will not come down towards 2%, which of course would basically be a failure on our part if, if that type of expectation became embedded. Yeah. Given the record high inflation of the euro area, or in the euro area, um, it's, yeah, it's at least for some policy maker it's not understandable why you would not hike rates by 50 basis points in July. So, why are you hesitant to do so, apart well, I mean, from that's nice? I think it's very important to, to uh, make sure that we understand that monetary policy works through the whole yield curve. And uh, we've seen uh, this year, compared to where we were in December, the yield curve has jumped quite a bit. So uh, for many people, if the interest rate that, that matters to you is the two-year ahead rate, the five-year ahead rate, the ten-year ahead rate, all of these have moved quite a bit. So uh, for us, uh, the issue is, is not any one meeting. It's, it's the sequence that we expect to see. And uh, if you think about the third quarter, um, between July and September, uh, essentially what we've said is uh, there's going to be two hikes. Um, we've said that if the inflation situation basically is maintained or gets worse, the second hike will be bigger than 25 basis points. So then you're looking at, at uh, one quarter, July and September, a few weeks apart, uh, having uh, rate hikes of at least 50 basis points and possibly more mm. collectively. And for one quarter, um, that's a fairly sizable uh, move already. So I think in the context of saying there's going to be two hikes, July and September, it makes sense that the first hike in, in July um, will, will be 25 basis points. And really the big debate between now and the September meeting is the appropriate size of that second hike in September. I would like to bring you back to something that you said earlier, like if there is potentially an external shock, would that potentially be um, the stop of gas deliveries to, to the euro area? What would that do to your rate setting? Well, clearly there would be many uh, implications, uh, which by the way uh, the staff looked at in the June um, projection exercise. There is a downside scenario, which includes um, an element of an embargo and, and rationing. And it's clear if we had a rationing of energy in Europe, there would be a much bigger hit to the economy. Um, there would be a bigger spike for sure, I think, in energy prices at the start. But because of the fact, um, you know, the, the ability to substitute away from, from gas in the near term it is, uh, it's not zero, but it's limited, that, the, that these are scenarios where there would be a much bigger uh, drop in GDP in the coming months. And, uh, you know, the staff forecast had higher inflation initially in 22-23, uh, but in fact lower inflation in 24, because the recessionary effect of that would, would 
mean uh, less uh, heat in the labour market, for example. So we would have to uh, very much look at that scenario, but hand in hand about some of what else we've talked about. Uh, what is it doing to inflation expectations? What is it doing to wage dynamics before we would, I think, uh, form an overall conclusion? Okay. Um, let me bring you to the topic of this emergency meeting which you recently, recently had. Um, why did you decide to have it and why at that time? So I think it's, um, I disagree with your phrasing. Uh, what, what is true is an ad hoc meeting. Okay. We decided, because it's very, let me emphasize, it is not the case we think the European economy is in an emergency situation. It was not an emergency situation but I think, uh, for sure, we do think uh, that's important to be agile and responsive. And, uh, you know, in, in the week, uh, the 10 days after the June monetary policy meeting, um, there were starting to be signs uh, of, of fragmentation risk. And rather than, you know, sit around and uh, be, be passive about it, it, I think it made a lot of sense uh, to have that ad hoc meeting. And as the President uh, announced this morning, one outcome of that is we will be, from Friday, July 1, uh, uh, reinvesting the PET portfolio on a flexible basis. We've also said uh, the, the staff, the committees, will be working on, on this more general anti-fragmentation tool. So I think it's just good policy making to be uh, agile, to be well prepared, um, and, and to make sure that we, we don't uh, take a passive attitude to these risks. Um, let's talk about that potential or that anti-fragmentation tool. So what have to be the key features? Some um, governors here on the ground were already suggesting that it should have no limits, it should be really free, but at the same time I hear the German Constitutional Court already appealing against it when I hear like a limitless tool. Right, right. So I mean I think of course uh, we will always operate within our mandate, we will always operate uh, within, within a legal framework. And I think uh, it's, you know, I think uh, once we, we've got this worked out, once it's designed, uh, we, will, we will explain it. But I think uh, today uh, it's, you know, it's better to let the, the staff continue their work uh, rather than try and uh, preview too much uh, what the design will look like. But essentially, and I think uh, President Lagarde said this today, uh, the bottom line is we will make sure it's an effective tool. It will do the job that is intended. And uh, I think we can uh, combine being effective with also respecting all of the treaty uh, obligations we have, those very important, uh, uh, legal, that very important legal framework which makes sure uh, we do what we need to do for monetary policy while remaining within, within the legal framework. Would one option also be to sell core um, to bring those yields higher than the yield gap is also closing? Well, again, I, I don't really want to, to pre, uh, preempt the, the design of the tool. Um, but what I would emphasize, maybe two points. One is uh, fragmentation risk uh, does have an asymmetry about it. Um, you know, there's many different uh, scenarios that one can look at. One scenario is, a, if you like, a rotation from holding the, the bonds of the periphery towards holding uh, the bonds of the core. But I think in terms of thinking about that rotation, uh, you have to look closely about the implications for the monetary policy stance. And we're always clear about making sure that, that the stance uh, and the anti-fragmentation uh, dimension uh, are, are married but in a way that doesn't compromise the, the, the stance. And so any you know, conception about uh, the, the, the yields in the core uh, absolutely will have to be looked at. Uh, very much so. It's interesting. I think that the junction where you are, it's probably the most difficult one to withdraw the stimulus from the markets. We've seen like this taper tantrum in the States some years ago. Are you concerned about such an overreaction? Well, I mean, I think it's very important. I mean, look what's happened uh, from, from December uh, to now. So we, we now have six months where, by and large, going from a, a very high rate of purchasing in 2021 uh, to uh, stopping now. I mean, we're in the last uh, couple of days uh, of the uh, of the purchasing now, uh, uh, net purchasing under the APP. By and large, I would say uh, that has gone uh, quite smoothly. Uh, we have seen a steepening in the yield curve, 
maybe in part that has to do with the end of net purchases. In part, of course, it's a mix of expecting us to raise the policy rate over time. Uh, so the, and also, the, there is global uncertainty. So there, there is a rising uh, term premium here in the US. There is global uncertainty about inflation, and that's going to be reflected in long-term yields. So going back to, to the last couple of weeks, uh, it's very much, uh, I think, just a good management by us. Uh, to, to make sure that we do have um, uh, a response to, to any uh, risk of fragmentation. Uh, we, we're go getting going we, with flexibility in pet reinvestment. Uh, we're working hard on having a more general tool. Um, but I, I think it's important uh, to, to be clear that by and large, uh, the rotation by us, the rotation globally, where central banks are moving away from super accommodative policies, uh, more towards uh, normal policies, towards neutral policies, uh, has been going on for months now. And in the grand scheme of things, it's been relatively smooth. And I, I do think uh, uh, it's important that, that we are able to, uh, to deliver uh, that predictable uh, uh, policy that makes sure interest rates are on the right path, um, again, but, but in a very orderly manner. One last question on recession, because the recession word comes up more often and more frequently also in discussion with uh, CEOs in almost every part of the world. So what's your scenario? So again, in, in our June uh, baseline, we have the European economy continuing to grow because let's not forget the reopening of the economy. Uh, we, we do think uh, many bottlenecks will be are easing and will ease. So what I would say is, especially if you talk to CEOs and so on, there may well be some industries which do see um, a decline. Uh, there may well be um, uh, simultaneously uh, that. We do think uh, this year uh, households, um, even though more going back to work, the high inflation rate does mean a, a decline in living standards this year for many people. So there is a, a kind of feel bad effect uh, at a particular industry level, uh, for many households, especially uh, lower income households, that is true. But in the aggregate, we do still think the European economy will continue to grow, but with clear downside risk. So our central scenario, when we kind of work through everything, it is uh, continuing to grow. There is an acknowledgement of downside risk, which could extend to recession risk. Um, but then I think people live in individual sectors, uh, and as, as individuals, as households, um, there may well be a loss of living standards this year.